Hello, this is Chris Kobe with the League of Women Voters of Portland. You are watching the Video Voters Guide. In conjunction with Metro East Community Media, we are here to talk with candidates running in the May 2020 primary election. With me today is Adrian Brown, running for Judge of the Circuit Court, 4th District, which is Multnomah County, position 12. Welcome, Adrian. And would you please tell us a little bit about yourself and why you're running for judge and what distinguishes you from the other candidates? Sure, certainly. Thank you, Chris. So I am a mom, a veteran, and an advocate. I value public service, and I walk the talk when it comes to public service. So I start with a story about my mother and how she has impacted my choice to pursue public service as a passion. And that comes from my mom struggling to get child support for my sister and I. As a young child, uh, she was a single mom. She was working, she was getting her graduate degree. And it wasn't until I was a teenager that she successfully was able to hold my father accountable for child support. And that was the leadership of a judge. A judge is the one that finally gave my sister and my mom and I justice through a child support order, and it changed our lives. And so I value public service as the ability to do the right thing for the right reasons. And I have now pursued public service for the entirety of my 20 year legal career. I started out as an Air Force JAG officer and I was able to serve on both sides of the, uh, the bar in the courtroom as a litigator. I was a prosecutor. I helped prepare child victims to testify in both physical and sexual abuse. And then I was competitively selected to serve as a defense counsel and I also got to have the honor of representing individuals who had been accused of those same crimes and then needing to cross-examine uh, child victims uh, as a part of my representation of my client. And so as a judge, I bring a unique perspective in having served both sides of the system and understanding the compassion that's necessary to really appreciate the humanity of each individual. My public service then extended after the Air Force, after about seven years, I wanted to come back to the community I knew as home and that's Portland. And I continued as a litigator with the United States Attorney's Office. And for the past 10 years, I have been a champion for civil rights enforcement in the District of Oregon. And what that means is that I have both helped individuals make sure that their rights are protected um, under the Americans with Disabilities Act, as well as the Fair Housing Act as well as veterans who um, have uh, employment discrimination protections. And I have also worked on systemic reform issues at the really the institutional and cultural level, both in the provision of community mental health services, as well as police reform. And these are issues that are thrusted before our courts. The intersection between mental illness, addiction issues, homelessness, veterans, is every day before the court. And so I am uniquely qualified uh, to bring my experience on both having served both sides of the system, having been both in a criminal attorney as well as a civil attorney, and coming before and being able to serve as a neutral to ensure access to justice for the entire community. Adrian, these are tumultuous times. What challenges have been and will be created by the pandemic? to the effective and efficient administration of justice, and how do you propose to meet those challenges? Yes, so first of all, this is an extremely challenging time for people on many levels, and that cannot be overstated. I am aware that our first obligation of the court is to serve the public and do no harm in serving the public. And jurors are at the heart of our justice system. If we can't get jurors to participate, we can't have trials. We can't meet the constitutional requirements of our justice system. And so one of the first challenges is going to be, how do we 
now completely re-look at how jurors, how the public accesses the public court system. And this gets back to the heart of access to justice. And, and, and part of that is making sure that stakeholders have a say in that process. And I have learned this through the work I've done in the community. So both in my work on uh, the city of Portland case and looking at police reform issues and accountability, as well as my work in the larger state context and community mental health and addressing gaps in that system. This is one of the challenges the court's gonna have to meet now, which is how do we look at making sure that our system is still accessible? That has been a, um, uh, very much on people's minds, both on the criminal side and ensuring that constitutional rights are protected of people who are accused of crimes, as well as making sure that victims have the opportunity to be heard and have a, an availability to make sure that they can um, get the necessary services they need. And then on the civil side as well, we have individuals who are, as we know, one in eight have lost their jobs. Um, there are certainly a, a variety of trial attorneys that are gonna represent individuals who may not be facing a constitutional issue such as being incarcerated, but they may be dealing with something that is impacting their lives like they've never seen before, and that is a loss of a job, loss of health care. And so making sure that those folks and the attorneys that represent them have access to our system is also vitally important. And this is where I get back to the stakeholder work and bringing people together when we can and to the extent that we can bring people together and say, what can we do better? We cannot be afraid as judicial leaders to ask that question. Everyone can do better. It is certainly uh, a, a, a huge lift for the court to respond to an emergency such as COVID-19 and a health crisis. And we cannot be afraid to ask that question, what can we do better and ask it to everyone so they have a chance to have input and then we can make suggested changes in order to make sure access is available for everybody. Adrian, we have time for one more question. If we can keep the answer short, what is your philosophy of the purpose of sentencing in criminal cases? Yes. So the philosophy and sentencing is to make sure, first of all, that you both have protection of society, holding the, person accountable that has been found guilty. Now you're only in sentencing if there has been a finding of guilt. And then also ensuring that there is rehabilitation of that person. So you're not seeing that person back in the system again, right? It doesn't do society any good to incarcerate somebody and then for them to come back in society without any new tools, any new resources, and only to fall back into the system again. Along the same lines, if someone has underlying issues that need to be treated, then we also have to look at whether or not incarceration is the appropriate method. There may be other ways to, to um, involve sentences of individuals that can help both rehabilitate that person as well as protect society. And so we need to make sure we're looking at all of those things. And the, the, the work that has been done in the county, looking at how we can make sure that we're being very mindful of sentencing and the consequences of sentencing and the bias that can be involved in sentencing, I think it's extremely important to be an informed judge and to constantly be open to learning and learning how we can do better in our sentencing process. Thank you very much, Adrian. Uh, this has been the Video Voters Guide. The primary election is Tuesday, May 19. Be sure to inform yourself about the candidates and the single ballot measure on the gas tax and exercise your right to vote. Thank you for watching.